Hello, ladies and gentlemen, it's Mike here at Game From Scratch. And today we're going to be taking a look at the state of Unity. Now, Unity has gone through a lot of changes in the last year and a bit. Uh, they had their first major investor call just a couple days ago, and we're going to break down exactly what was announced there. So you as a game developer, what you can expect from Unity, and truth of the matter is, the words they said to the investors, anyways, are all quite encouraging. Now, this is a different audience than, obviously, us as creators, but you can see that they've found that creators are important. They realize the error of the runtime fee, and they seem to be focused focusing on the right areas. By the way, this video is being brought to you by and created in Camtasia. I use this tool to make all of my videos. Stay tuned to later in this video and I will explain why. All right, so let's jump in. We're gonna start things off with the shareholder letter. I'm not gonna go through this line by line. There's too much here. But basically, quick summary is uh, they've doubled down on focusing on customers. The big thing here is last quarter, we focus on, cust uh, on fostering a culture of execution and discipline, accelerating the pace of product innovation and strengthening the bond with our customers and community. And that's just what we did. Cancellation of the runtime fee for gaming customers, reversion to a subscription-based model and the introduction of price increases that customers could Embrace has unblocked uh, renewals and accelerated new relationships. See, now that one's very big because basically you had a lot of people with the runtime fee coming in with Unity 6. They were like, screw it, we're not upgrading. So it looks like that's already starting to pay some fruit there. Uh, they also released Unity 6, uh, this version, and part of re the release with Unity 6, I covered this in my Unity 6 video, is they're going on a new upgrade cycle. So it's going to be easier just to do within version upgrades without breaking your product. So you'll actually be able to stay more up to date on the versions of Unity you're dealing with. Uh, so a combination of new approach, new pricing, new software has begun to change the decision calculus. When developers choose Unity, they are potentially building a business on top of our platform for decades. And we're dedicated to make that choice easier every day. The other key thing that they've announced here is uh, some hires. So they hired two new people here. Uh, the first one is a new CTO or Chief Technology Officer. This is Steve Collins. This guy has a pretty big resume, actually. He was the CTO at King, the company behind Candy Crush. Also, he was CTO at Havoc, as well as one of the co-founders, Havoc being a very popular physics engine that Microsoft bought, and I don't know what the heck they're doing with it these days, but Havoc was a big name for sure. Uh, and then he was also at the marketing company CTO for Swerve. Uh, and then they also hired a CFO, uh, Jared Yahez, I'm guessing. Uh, he was the CEO, or so, sorry, the CFO at Shutterstock before joining um, but he helped to drive the company's expansion into 3D content, data monetization, digital advertising. And that's kind of like the Unity grow side of the business. The CFO doesn't normally have too much impact, to be honest, on like game developer day-to-day -day stuff. But CTO definitely does. So this is an important hire. And it's part of, like again, the changing of the guard of the people that they're bringing in. Uh, and then uh, they, we talked about quarter, last quarter about embarking on fundamental rebuilds of our machine learning stack and data infrastructure designed to enhance the return on investment, uh, we're able to deliver to our advertising customers. So they've got new machine learning on their um, ads side of things as well. And then the rest of it is getting into the numbers side of things. I'm not going to go into the numbers in a ton of detail here, or really any detail, to be honest. Uh, just their revenue was slightly up. They're still losing money. Uh, it, how they present money, it, it, how these actual things go, you, you kind of have to dig into the numbers yourself because the summary is normally a bit of a lie. Uh, but after months of listening to customers, partners, and our community, we announced the cancellation of the runtime fee and reversion uh, to our existing seat-based license subscription model for all gaming customers. Also introduced pricing changes, which apply to all new and existing Unity Pro and Enterprise customers upon purchase renewal or upgrade. Uh, since announcing this decision, we've seen a positive trend in renewals and increase in early adoption of Unity 6. So um, the, the getting rid of the runtime fee does seem to be a good business move. It's never going to be a mistake they can undo, but it does seem to be going better. Uh, future impact on our Create, by the way, Create is basically the Unity engine itself division. Uh, subscription revenues will be dependent on the timing of renewals and contract negotiations with our enterprise customers. Uh, we believe that over time, these pricing changes will help to drive consistent revenue growth. Uh, again, a little bit about launching Unity 6. They've got a couple of other projects they are working on as well. They work for the ALLN KLM and Dutch Bond, a, ra um, a railway company, to do some um, visualization work there as well. And yeah, that is it. And the, the rest of this, if you want to do, you can get into like the breakdown of the numbers, all of these things here, the, the losses and the gains and, and so on. Not something I'm going to cover today. Instead, what I'm going to do is head on over to the developer call 
And this is basically where the uh, people that are investors giving investor guidance are asking questions. So it's kind of interesting because this is a different audience than what they would say to game developers, right? Uh, so you wonder if there's going to be double speak here when um, Ricky Tella was the CEO. Man, reading these was a joke. They would promise the world. They would go into like really flaky areas and they would talk about basically everything but gaming. Under the new CEO, Matthew Bromberg, I'm actually pretty happy with the answers I've read here. So I'm curious. I guess I think a lot of folks, myself included, have really focused on the numbers impact uh, numbers impact of introducing variable fees and less so, I think, the relationship consequences for you and some of the publishers that are using the platform. In other words, the investors wanted the money. Give me the money, give me the money, runtime fee. That's a great idea. Oh, wait, this is going to piss off your customers. We didn't think about that. So that's kind of what that sentence is saying. If we were to pull back and think about uh, that's how that's improving, what sort of opportunities uh, with sorts of enhancement or expansion of the existing relationships exist or maybe should be front and center for you guys in 2025. Um, it was to your point, the way in which we made the change and repealing the runtime fee as important as repealing as the repeal itself, which is to say the relationships we have with our customers and wanting to be in a position of partnership with them, knowing that they are going to be our customers for decades. Many of them have already been our customers for that long and knowing the opportunity to expand those relationships both on the platform and engine side as well as on the advertising monetization side makes it crucial that we prioritize that those relationships and I think to your point there was in some of the old way of thinking about pricing we kind of got away from that the sort of human relationship piece and fell back a little bit on abstraction basically kind of forgot about the customers uh, I mean truth is customers have to over a long period of time feel satisfied and feel in sync with the kind of value you're providing and how you are paying for it that is crucial for any long-term relationship so the way we went uh, the way we engaged in these conversations with customers and led up to it and the time we spent with them testing different ideas, asking for feedback was again, really important in terms of just resetting how we're going to be in the marketplace. To your point, over the long term, we were very bullish on the opportunity and um, to expand relationships with those and other customers. The opportunity to sell uh, consumption-based products, whether they be multiplayer tools, live ops services, tools for data management, asset management, consumption-based uh, pricing on AI-enhanced tools or other things are going to uh, be outgrowths of platform adoption in those customer relationships. I think the ultimate positive takeaway here is this sentence right here. So what I mean, is quite simply put, sitting with customers to design tools that deliver the value they need and want so that we, we can then abstract those solutions and sell them to many more customers. This is what you want to hear. This is Unity saying, we're going to build products for our customers that customers actually want. It's a good idea. That's a, that's a good focus. I'm happy to see that there. The next up we've got is, um, as you talk to customers this quarter, how has the cancellation of the runtime fee and the official launch of Unity 6 uh, changed the perception or willingness of customers to adopt the new game engine? So this is about Unity 6 adoption after getting rid of the runtime fee. Uh, it is important to remember that pricing that we repealed had a real blocker baked in, right? So it was, if... It was unattractive from a pricing perspective, but that those new prices were tied to the upgrade of Unity 6. So if you did not want to pay the new prices, all you had to do is not upgrade. That obviously was not a dynamic, uh, great dynamic for our perspective. In addition, um, sort of relationship elements and changing fundamentally and how we're about talking to customers. There was a really enormous practical input uh, impact in which, for example, at our Unite conference in Barcelona, where literally 50 customers came up to me and said, hey, uh, I had said, I told everybody internally, no upgrade in Unity 6. And now that we've you've repealed it and you've reverted to the subscription, we're going to green light. So those dynamics changed very radically. I think the important piece for us and also came out at our user conference in Unite was, and I hope the customers heard from us that the most important thing from our perspective going forward is going to be stability and support, ensuring that folks can use our platform for many years and not have to make trade-offs between adopting features and stability. And we spent a lot of time at Unite. Of course, we always talk a little bit about some exciting new things that are coming down the road, but most of what we talked about was how we can help right now and how we can be better partners. And we have felt the impact of all of those changes. Unity 6 has been downloaded more than 500,000 times now, which is uh, really quickly and pretty significant number for a product that really just starting uh, and compares really favorably to some of our historical numbers in that regard. So good news there. And I think you guys may have saw that AI comment a while back. So here we got another analyst. Excellent. So I've got the obligatory gen AI question. So Matt, there's a bunch of startups that are building asset creation tools for gaming. Uh, there's even new like entire environments like Google DeepMind launched this thing called Genie a few months ago that attempt to replicate elements of the create stack. I mean, a lot of this is still pretty crappy and that is 100% true. Uh, but if you look at the pace of improvements of these diffusion models and of AI in general, it's getting pretty good quick, uh, pretty 
it's pretty good pretty quickly. So I guess just as long as the uh, industry, how do you see and how are your customers integrating Gen AI into the workflow? How do you think this might impact your business um, either from pricing or a cost perspective? How do you think this kind of integration over the next couple of years? So this is where it could get scary. And in the past, Uni would have said, oh, we've got all the AI. We're going to have everything AI. We're going to have this. We're going to have that. We're going to have this. We're going to have that. So this one I think is a very clarifying answer. Um, I appreciate the question, and it's a really important one. Look, we know that AI has a fundamental role to play with our customers in terms of, as I mentioned earlier, making the process of building video games faster and easier and more engaging and innovative. So we are a platform and an assembly point for games and other applications. So, and our extensibility is really our greatest strength, so we feel perfectly positioned to help developers integrate these tools. Keep in mind that from our perspective, we're agnostic as to where and how 3D assets get created. Uh, we're about being an assembly point, providing close control, uh, the pipelines you need to build, uh, helping your team collaborate to do a build, uh, to do that building, and then ultimately cross-platform distribution through the runtime. So the explosion of Gen AI from our perspective, if it helps our customers, then we are going to kind of benefit from a seamless integration of the best first-party and third-party AI functionality inside of our editor, inside the editor. Um, and we're going to offer those those that to customers. Okay, I'm doing a direct quote, so this does get a little stumbly at times. So we feel very good about that, and we're not kind of fighting that at all. So basically, they're going to say, we will enable AI in our tools for like third party, and also I do believe it said first party. So um, AI is not anathema to them, but it also doesn't seem to be their focus here. Uh, in fact, we're really excited about it. I think the second piece that I mentioned a little bit is we really believe that our focus should be on AI. I like this sentence. To using AI to obfuscate some of the complexity in our tools to help unlock and accelerate difficult time-consuming tasks and workflows that our creators are already doing in our tools. So this is AI as a supplemental tool, not as a replacement tool. So this is about making the drudge work inside of the tools AI-powered. I think this is an area where pretty much everybody likes the idea of AI. You know, taking away the drudge work, the non-creative work. Um, that's why, and that is just, we can have a massive impact again on the equation that game companies make. They're working through this equation on how many new starts can I have every year, right? I got a certain amount of dollars, a couple of points of EBITDA, by the way, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. You'll see that all the time in financial results. Uh, I'm going to use um, to make new games. How many games can I make? The more effect, uh, efficiently and the more quickly they can make games, the more starts we'll have, the more innovation we'll have. So it's, I believe it's really at the core of the next stage of growth of our industry. And we mean to play a really important part in that. Last thing I say is interesting to you, our DeepMind example, DeepMind is a unique customer uh, and much of the work leverages our technology. So we, we do have a really fundamental role to play here that is um, really throughout the AI ecosystem. It's one I think we can get smarter and better at over time. And it's one we're spending a lot of time on. So that's the AI answer. It doesn't terrify me or anything to that effect. It's, you know, they can't ignore AI, but their approach to it, I find it tolerable if I'm honest. So uh, go, uh, how was this news received by the investment community ultimately? So two analysts have rated the stock with a sell rating, nine have a hold rating, and six have given it a buy rating. So you net that one out. And to be honest, that's pretty okay response because uh, Unity aren't saying that we're going to move into this market, that market, or explode, you know, ex uh, have exponential growth, which is what we need them to stop saying, like, as actual game developers. And the um, the industry seems to be okay with it. Now, the, the stock is taking a bath today, but who knows what will ultimately happen with that in the end. So, special thanks to TechSmith Camtasia for sponsoring this video. It is literally the software I use to create this video and, like, 99% of the other videos since I started this channel. And the biggest reason why is it just makes my life so easy. It's got all of the tooling I need to do my screen capture, the editing, and so on. You actually see a time-lapse version of the Unity 7 video I did. So, you get an idea of the kind of workflow that's involved. And, to be honest, it's just the simplest tool to use. So, if you want to go ahead and check it out, there is a fully functioning version that has a watermark on export or you could go ahead and buy it. Use the code GAMEFORSCRATCH at checkout and you will save 15% off. So special thank Camtasia for sponsoring this video. And that's it, folks. A quick look at the state of Unity right now. These are talking to a different audience and what they're saying is still something I think is a positive for game developers. It does seem like Unity are on the right track, but I'm curious what your opinion of this uh, is. is. Was there anything said that scared you, made you happy? Let me know in the comments down below and I will talk to you all later. Goodbye.